80 Days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Werner's most famous work. kind of weird in Hollywood how all the stories that seem to have been made in a dramatic fashion whether it's Disney or any of the other big studios ironically they all start with the same thing well it's described as, as a log line it's a simple one sentence line which basically sums up what the dramatic premise of the film is and it's it's a protagonist He's the hero or heroine of the story. And it's an antagonist who's kind of the anti-hero that helps the thing move along. And it's an inciting incident. And as a storyteller, a writer of films and, and documentaries and things, when one is con conjuring up or the idea for a dramatic piece, you've got to invent, you know, your protagonist, your antagonist, and your inciting incident. And one of the things that is an often tread path, and it doesn't matter if it's Brian Mills, you know, whose daughter is suddenly kidnapped by human traffickers in Taken. Or it's Jamie Lannister in Game of Thrones, where he loses his royal privileges, gets captured, gets his sword hand chopped off. Yeah, this should help you remember. The more harrowing the kind of situation you put your protagonist in, the more, more identifiable and more empathy you're gonna have with that person. In fact, I've often imagined what would be the worst kind of situation for your hero well, in my sadistic imagination, I would imagine for one minute the character is having, you know, a great life. It's normal. Somebody else is here. Then all of a sudden, it, it all changes in a flash. And it goes from, you know, a normal scenario into the most horrendous, nightmarish situation possible. You want to have them at their complete and utter total mercy. In this scenario, there is no cavalry coming to save them. Put them in a foreign city, foreign country, where they don't know anybody, they don't even know the language, they don't, they don't know what's happening to them. Can you imagine yourself being in that situation? Facing death, in agony, foreign city, not knowing what is happening, not knowing any way how to get out of it, being at the complete will of destiny. How would you imagine that? How would, how would you deal with that if that was you and it was a real situation? I asked that question because literally six weeks ago, that happened to me. I'd like to tell you the story of how I, how I got out of that situation, how I got into that situation and what I learned about life in the universe, and more importantly, what I learned about myself. Veda Napoli, a poi muari, which effectively translated means, see Naples and die which is effectively what almost happened to me. And if you don't believe me, check out this. I have a zipper, 30 staples running from my sternum past my navel. 
I had emergency surgery here for a perforated abdominal. So how is that even possible? You may be wondering. Before I left on this trip, I'd done pretty much everything that a human being could do to be in good shape to travel. And in the last six months, I was doing probably five or six workouts a week, four Muay Thai intense cardio sessions and then another two or three weight sessions. I wasn't suffering any known images or illnesses. And I had blood tests, you know, for my liver, diabetes, sugars, all those kinds of things. Everything was A plus. For my age, I was probably in as good a shape as one could be. So now the journey begins. I'm in London, heading on to the first form of transportation in my 80 days series. I was on the final part of a pretty grueling round the world trip. I had stops in LA, New York, Miami, London, Paris, Milan, Siena. Walking around New York I was so sick. I had a head cold, my stomach was killing me, my lungs were congested. The weather was awful, I was freezing and wet. God, I couldn't wait to get out of that place. My last stop was in Naples, Italy. I'd been feeling unwell the whole time and I kind of put it down to the fact that, hey, maybe I've finally gotten COVID. You know, I had flu-like symptoms, I had no appetite, no, not much energy, and I had this consistent pain in the stomach, which was really annoying me, I couldn't eat. And as well as the traveling part with the meetings and working on the various film projects, I'd also set myself an added task, the ambitious goal of trying to master the solo one-man band thing of writing, filming, performing, and on camera and doing all the recording sound, lighting cameras, drone operation for a new solo travel series. I really had enough to chew on with all of that without allowing myself to be sick. One of the most brutal bouts of jet lag I've ever had. I think it gets harder the older I get. My stomach was killing me, I couldn't eat. Um, but for some reason I couldn't sleep either. So literally no sleep, up at four o'clock, into the airport. I should have recognized that the warning lights were flashing red. I ignored them. I was an idiot. I left Sydney on the 16th of September, and after all my travels, I'd arrived in Naples Friday the 14th of October. I was planning to stay there three nights and then fly out home via Rome, Munich, Singapore on Wednesday the 19th of October. And we're in Napoli. I went to dinner with my best friend Ivan that evening. He was excited to see me and we started out on the town to take in a bit of a city tour. Caught up with his friend Nuncio, the entre entrepreneur behind the prestigious Diliberti multi-brand chain of boutiques that carry all the hot brands like Balenciaga. Went and met all his friends in his main store and then Ivan took me out on the Friday night downtown Naples, which was so alive, so pumping. Everybody was out on a Friday evening. It had been a warm summer kind of day, even though it was almost going into winter. We went to dinner, a cool fresco place, and despite being hungry, I really couldn't eat. I ordered a spaghetti alla vongole, which I was just dying to, to have. Couldn't eat it, I felt tired.
said to my friend Ivan that we've got to get your friend to a hospital for some tests. He said he wasn't sure what it was, but it could be serious. No doubt his quick action saved my life. So next thing I know, they call the ambulance. I'm being put on a stretcher or a gurney and shoved into the, shunted into the back of an ambulance, a Neapolitan ambulance, something that I've never had the experience of before. And there we were, speeding through the back streets of Naples with the siren blaring. It was really quite surreal. It, so the ambulance got me to the nearest hospital. I had no idea what it was, if it was a new hospital, a modern hospital, if they had electricity, if they, you know, had anything, or even trained doctors. I was rushed through these red doors. And it was a very Catholic hospital. You know, I could hear mass being served background. There were religious statues and crucifixes were all over the walls. The Virgin Mary, Christ the Redeemer, there was various saints. There was even a chapel inside the hospital with a frescoed roof. I was really in the house of God. I looked up at all the religious statues and I wondered if he, the big guy, knew that many years ago I was a serving altar boy at St. Mark's Church and school. Now, it had been many years since I called myself a Catholic or anything close to that. In fact, the only thing I really kind of identified with is being a Buddhist. But I have to say, when your own mortality and death is on the menu, it's strangely comforting to know that I was in a house that had those kinds of values. Now, this has taken medical tourism to a new level. About to be admitted in the hospital after a quick ambulance ride. Here's me, just prior to surgery, wrecking jokes into my iPhone. Just before being put into a surgical gown, and I was allocated this bed. Goodness gracious. Just been allocated a bed in the Holocaust ward. These are my roommates. And this is me. As I was being raced through the, the hospital, clearly with a sense of urgency, and, and you know, if you know anything about hospitals, if you have a broken arm or a broken leg, they're likely to leave you in, in the casualty area for two hours before somebody bothers to come and have a look at you. Um, they, they're in no rush unless it's a life-threatening emergency. And all of a sudden, I was given priority number one as they rushed me through everything. When I went through the surgery doors, um, I, did, I did think, I did reflect, and I knew exactly the situation that I was in. I was in excruciating pain. I was facing a life-ending situation. I was in a foreign city. Nobody was able to explain to me what was happening, what I needed to happen, if I had a good chance or if I had any chance of living. And what would happen afterwards, you know, would, I knew nothing. Fortunately, after four hours of surgery, they managed to um, isolate the perforation and, and patch it up, cut it out, repair it, and in the process, create an incision that was about 30 centimeters long and had 36 staples in it. This is me just out of surgery, probably. Surgery was four hours, I'm told, late afternoon. And man, I had seven pipes in me. I had one in my nose, one in my penis, a catheter, one in each arm, three in my navel. And this was my dinner. Dinner was served. I had endless bottles of you know, antibiotics and nutrients and saline drips and, and they changed them all the time. Literally, it was Tube City. After the surgery, I literally couldn't move. I couldn't even lift my head more than about this. And day two, no, day three, I think it was, they removed the bandage and to put a fresh one on. And this is what I saw. Thinking that it may have been keyhole surgery, I saw an incision that looked like I'd been attacked by a great white shark. And all of this, <laughs> no pain medication, because in Italy, 
They don't do pain medication. This is some of the testing equipment that I had with ultrasounds and x-rays and barium dyes. The day before I was released, I actually got a PDF of a summary. Um, it was just a three page, a small PDF. The first page was um, a summary of what the condition I was treated for. And then the last two were really the care um, instructions as to what I should do with my diet and how I had to come back in 10 days to have the staples removed before they would clear me to fly. I found that I not only had an abdominal perforation, which required emergency surgery, I also found I had peritonitis, which is a fatal and connected kind of in infection. Kind of grateful that I had the chance to read up on this after I'd made it through surgery, because it's, it's a pretty gruesome kind of read, a very somber read. And if you are somebody that's suffering with it, I'm not sure if I would like to you to read it. I'll let you have a read for yourself. These are web pages off prestigious international hospitals talking about the severity of peritonitis, how painful it is. Is it serious? Is it lethal? How you die from it within a few days? how it kills you. That's day eight, post-surgery. Got my first meal. The day before was just a cup of soup, pureed apple, and some broth with these tiny little pasta micro dots, like hundreds and thousands in it. So the food wasn't much to write home about, but the view at, the, at sunset was pretty good. No complaints for me. This is the exterior. And if you ever fi find yourself being admitted to this hospital um, in an emergency, count your lucky stars because it's a beautiful place. It's a place I owe my life to, and it will never be forgotten. And never in my life have I ever been more grateful for a bed, 311D. I was instructed to remain in Naples for recovering for another 10 days before I would go back to have the staples removed and then if all clear, they would let me fly. It was all very small steps, one day at a time. So I'll be very, forever grateful to the nurses, the staff, the doctors at Father Bene Fratelli Hospital and also to my amazing dear friend, Ivan Salerno, who literally dropped everything to be by my side for those 10 days. So this is the exterior of the hospital that I came in. And this is the, the emergency ambulance entrance. So I came in last Saturday. It's Friday today. Um, my surgeon told me he, he did keyhole surgery. I had some of my tubes removed today and they took the bandage off and I got a chance to look at it. And there's a, a 20 centimetre zipper scar right down the middle of my stomach, which doesn't appear to be keyhole surgery. Anyway, I'll wear that as a badge of honour for the rest of my life. I landed back in Sydney um, Saturday the 5th of November in the evening. And today it's, it's about 30 days since surgery. My wound has healed surprisingly well. It's almost completely closed. And whilst I'm realistic that I have a long recovery ahead, I'm confident I'll make a pretty decent recovery. It was an adventure that will be hard to forget. So what lessons did I take out of all of that? Actually, there were, there were quite, quite a few, many in fact. I can tell you that, that life is precious. All life is precious. You should appreciate every second of it and you should appreciate every person. And every day, and every minute of every day, be thankful for the experiences and, and freedoms that you have. Being able to feel the sun on your face is quite a dramatic thing when you, you think you may never feel the sun on your face again. 
stop the smell, smell of flower. Marvel at nature, look at a tree. Spend time each day doing those things. Worry about the things that you can control. Let go of the things that you can't control. Look after your health. It's precious because once it's gone, it's gone. And live in the now.